It all started in the year 2000. I was 17 years old, and I walked with my backpack through unpaved alleys in the outskirts of Beijing. I saw men cycling with entire closets and fridges on the back. I saw little kids running around half naked, playing football, while their parents were trying to sell mushrooms and spinach sitting on the ground. I saw a butcher behind a stand swatting flies that were trying to sit on his meat. Everybody was smiling, including this guy, literally sitting on his business, trying to sell second-hand computers. Why was I so touched by these Chinese people and their country? Was it the typical smile that covered up a world I didn't know yet? Or was it the energy I felt when walking through such streets? The only way to find out was to start learning Chinese and to start communicating with these people, to learn more about their world, because their world is so different from ours. I mean, the way people behave, the way people interact. Take this, for example. A subway station in China during rush hour. Which one of you has been on a subway in China before? Well, then you definitely know that getting on a subway in China is not easy. But getting off a subway in China is nearly impossible. <laughs> People just use their elbows to squeeze themselves away in and don't give you any space to get out. So looking at such examples, in combination with the fact that Chinese don't really express their emotions as much as we do, you might believe that Chinese are tough and cold-hearted people. But in fact, for Chinese, warm relations are very important. You might even say that Maslev has it wrong. Relations are not in the third level of human needs. They're really a necessity in life. And I believe that we, Westerners that tend to point our fingers at what happens in China, I believe that we can e even learn from the Chinese and how they deal with others. And if we project that on our own behavior, I think we can become better people. I even wish that every one of you has the opportunity to fly to China once in their lifetime, not just to climb the Great Wall, but to really listen to the Chinese, to what they have to say. Why is it that a relationship in China is so important? Still, nowadays, many Chinese are strongly influenced by the thoughts of a man named Confucius. His sayings are really like a Bible to the Chinese. I mean, here in the Western world, the Bible gains less and less support nowadays, but in China, his sayings are alive and kicking. It's really a great pleasure to meet friends from afar. So Confucius' philosophy emphasizes personal and governmental morality, correctness of social relationships, justice, sincerity. He champions strong family loyalty, ancestor worship, and respect for the elderly. So knowing this, you might understand why relationships are so important in China and why you need to build relationships in order to become successful. Maybe some of you have that experience in China. And then you might have heard of the word guanxi. Guanxi literally means connections or relationships. But actually, it's much more than that. Guanxi is like how things get done in China. Yes, Chinese are hesitant to deal with people they've never met. And there's a long phase of introduction needed. But once you reach the phase of mutual trust, you will find that Chinese are extremely loyal and faithful. So why is it that Quancy is so different from how we know it? I mean, there are many characteristics, most of them strongly based on the philosophy of Confucius, that cause these differences. But there are three of them I would like to share with you tonight. In China, if you want to maintain your relationship, there's one requirement, referred to as reciprocal favor, 人情 in Chinese. 
if you ask someone for a favor, the favor needs to be returned eventually. If you fail to repay, this is really seen as something unforgivable in China. So the more you ask from someone, the more you owe them. And this is how Guanxi is like a never-ending cycle of favors. Let me give you an example. I don't know how about you, but I barely remember the names of the teachers in my primary school. My Chinese colleagues and friends, however, they visit their teachers for tea, who are now in their 70s, for tea every Sunday afternoon, every week since they graduated. This is for them a way to repay for what they once received years ago. I love this. I love it how the Chinese have this long-term view. So where does this need for balance come from? Think of concepts like yin and yang and feng shui. I mean, retailers like IKEA might use such concepts for commercial purposes. But in China, these are really important values in life. I once sat with a business partner in his office in Beijing, and we were discussing a certain subject, um, but I felt my words didn't really reach him. So he was just shuffling in his seat, and at some point he interrupted me, saying, Valerie, I'm sorry, but do you mind swapping chairs? I'm not comfortable sitting in this angle from the main entrance. So in line with this culture, there's another concept that is very valuable to the Chinese, referred to as harmony. He. Harmony stresses the preference of a smooth running of a society or a group. So Chinese prefer to await the right moment instead of pushing through a certain request, like we sometimes tend to do here. So when you don't notice, it might come across as if Chinese are extremely lazy, waiting until the very last moment to fix things. But that's not the case. And if you bring your checklists and your deadlines to China, and you think that's going to work, you will have difficult times. And believe me, I know. So in 2000, I was traveling through the countryside of China. And back then, people were quite shocked seeing a tall red hat passing by. At some point, I even had to help a cycler get back on his feet after hitting a tree while looking at me. <laughs> so I arrived in Taishan, a small, relatively small town in the south of China. And there I met a girl, or actually, at first I walked and I couldn't find a place to sleep. So I was just wandering around, and there I met a girl named Chen Wan. And she asked me to be my friend. And we just sat down the entire afternoon in the park, learning each other's language. But as time passed by, I felt more and more uncomfortable about the fact that I still didn't have a place to sleep. So I shared my worry with my new friend, but she just waved aside my question. I tended to ask again and again, but I managed not to, and just wait and see what would happen. So after a while, I just obediently followed her for a long walk and a two-hour bus drive over unpaved roads, sometimes stopped by 20 donkeys trying to cross the road. So eventually, we arrived at a very outdated school building, and on the third floor, there was a room the size of my kitchen, filled with six bunk beds, offering space for 12 girls to sleep, to live, and to study. So I spent a few days and nights with my Chinese peers learning about their student lives and their environment, and I tell you, it was so much more interesting than a boring hotel. So I really believe if we'd managed to sometimes put our impatience aside and really see and wait what would come across, and are open, if you're open to the approach of the Chinese, then much more beautiful things come to you. So the last characteristic that is probably difficult for us to understand is the fact that for Chinese, for many Chinese, making a mistake in public is one of the most humiliating things in life. Face, reputation, mianzi in Chinese, really determines your position in a social network. So face depends on how attractive you are, how many friends you have, the skills you have, the connections you have, how much money you have. 
Faith can be earned, but faith can also be lost. So in the day-to-day -day lives of Chinese, faith plays a crucial role. To give you an example, a Dutch client of us signed a contract with their Chinese local partner, Mr. Fan, who was also a good friend of us. And everybody was happy because of long negotiations after a few days, and then the Dutch client left back home. One day after the Dutch client flew home, Mr. Fan turned to us, his face in terror. One of the investors had stepped out. And of course, it would have mean, meant a showstopper for the cooperation. But to be honest, we were really happy that Mr. Fan turned to us instead of directly contacting the Dutch client. Because naturally, the Dutch client would have become very angry, causing Mr. Fan to lose his face, ruining the long-term relationship. Now we had the opportunity to together find a solution, close the gap by finding another investor. And doing this, we saved Mr. Fan's face and the business of our client. So also here, I feel that if we manage to look at a certain situation from different angles, I believe it will positively benefit our business accomplishments. So I have a picture, this picture, largely projected on my wall in our office in Amsterdam. Because this man reminds me of the first time I set foot on Chinese soil. And he reminds me of all the lessons that I've learned over the years. To have a long-term view, to be patient, to be open, and to be a good listener. So I hope tonight I inspired you to also consider your own approach. And I welcome you to fly with me to China to learn from the Chinese.